Cain was a very jealous man. His countenance fell when he was not as pleasing as his brother was. So what do you do when jealousy comes and you have not risen up to what you hoped you would be? You sometimes will kill, <laughs> kill the person. And that's what he did. That's the error of Cain. What could he have done? Countenance, you know, sin is at your door. You, 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 you're going to be able to deal with it. What could he have done that would uh, change the whole story? So I'm not going to kill my brother. What could he have done about his sacrifice? His attitude, but also his gift. Sometimes people say, if I just have a bad attitude, that Cain just had a bad attitude. I agree with that. But the point is, what does God emphasize? His gift, doesn't he? Attitude comes with a gift, but regardless of if he had a good attitude, I think I'm going to please God and I'll just offer a sacrifice from the fruit of, my, from the, fruit of the land. He did that, Genesis 4. He did that. But where do you learn that he didn't give the, the excellent sacrifice that pleased God? Hebrews 11. By faith, he gave a more excellent sacrifice. So you realize, hmm, Genesis 4. And... and I, I say that because brethren have said our fellowship only depends upon people's attitude. I know that's not what's being said. Only, that's where they apply it. Got a good attitude, then that's, we'll, we'll, we'll accept that. But you're looking at the works, and Jude emphasizes the works that comes through people. Maybe they, they have a, a false teacher just has a good attitude, so he's okay. What does he teach? What do they practice? And so... But I want us to see what comes out of our heart and attitude will be reflected in the, the type of uh, sacrifice we offer to God. But Cain had a bad sacrifice because it didn't measure up to giving God the first fruits. And he was, he was condemned for that. And jealousy caused him to kill the one who did that. He gave the firstlings. His, his brother gave the firstlings of his flock. And so... I want us to realize that attitude and but actions go there. We're going to be judged by what we've done, not what we felt, not what our attitude was, but what we've done. And if a man is bad attitude because he wants to kill, have Paul in prison, uh, Paul said, I, I, he may, he, he'll have to answer to God for his attitude. But I care about the fact that he preached the truth. And wonder if a man with a bad attitude taught the truth. It's okay with Paul. I mean, he's going to, the sin is the attitude, he's going to deal with that, but just preach the truth. It's the action uh, that we're looking at. Is it according to truth? And hey, I can help him with his attitude down, down the road. But it all begins with an attitude maybe of, of, well, it doesn't make any difference what offer unto God. Did Abel give his by faith? Where does faith come from? Revelation from God. I think they both had the opportunity to understand what God wanted from them, the first fruits comes from, from them. And so, yes, it's a bad attitude, but the Bible emphasizes the action. Therefore, I emphasize the action. That was the, the problem. That was the way of Cain. He didn't offer the more excellent sacrifice. Now, what's the error of Balaam? Now, these, notice what fits, sets this up. They are men that, that are brutish. They, 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 they do not understand. It says what they understand naturally, not to creatures without reason. These and these are they going to be destroyed. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, Cain, Cain was destroyed. And the things that, that he was trying to do, and, and he had to be a wanderer and all of those things. Cursed he was. So what was the error of Balaam that brings Balaam woe? What was his problem? Yes, sir. Okay. How did he get him cursed? Because he sure didn't do it by prophecy, did he? No. And, and so that's, that's, that's what Balak wanted. So what do you see here in, in Jude? All, all we see is that they ran riotously in the error of, of Balaam. So there's that riotous, unrestrained life. So were they just a bunch of, bunch of drunkards? Or were they practicing fornication and offering sacrifices to idols? Which one would that be? Well, it might be? They might have been getting drunk too, but what does the Bible specify? 
fornication. And 2 Peter 2, but also in Revelation, we see the, the point being made. In Revelation 2, 14, to get straight to the point, he said, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast here some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to do what? Eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. The orgies came along with the idolatry, the riotous lifestyle. So we learn, again, from New Testament, some of the details that we're looking at in the, in the Old Testament and what uh, Jude is re referring to here. So here is indeed the, the error of Balaam. And what was, what was his motives? Why did he turn this way and, and uh, put a stumbling block in front of Balak and the, in the, from, from the Israelites? That indeed what, what Balak wanted, he got. Second Peter says he loved the hire of wrongdoing. He loved so Balak hired him. And he liked that, and what we see in Genesis, he couldn't, he couldn't go against what God was going to say. You're my prophet right now. You've got to speak the truth. Well, how did he accomplish this? Balak gets his way. He paid for it, and he got it. He put this stumbling block. So you read, you, you read in, in, in Numbers 24, you see all of, the, all of the prophecies, and all of a sudden, Numbers 25, in the area of Shittim, you find the Moabites and the Israelites practicing idolatry together. And how did he get the people cursed? Get them to sin against God. How did the authorities try to get Daniel put to death? Put his, his belief in practice and it will contradict what we said the king should, should do and so forth. Just get them to contradict God's law. And, and the point is, is that here is God cursed them because they practiced fornication and sacrifice unto idols. And he taught them, I, I want the money. I want all that time when we saw, we see his attitude, we see his heart, all the time he's really wanting to do that, but his actions were, you know, it shows you inspiration, the type of inspiration that God has. He couldn't but prophesy the truth. But we see what happened at the end. So you, and, and then it finally that uh, he, was, he was destroyed as well. But there's a, there's a sense of, of uh, the wrongdoing is practicing fornication and therefore Balak got his way and he paid the man to do it. And Balaam, because of his heart, was such that he wanted to be that way, uh, he was destroyed too. And so we see another example here with Jew, with not only Cain, but Balaam, but what about Korah? Who was Korah in the Bible? Was he of the Aaronic priesthood, or was he just one of the tribe of the Levites? Was, which one was it? He was a Levite. And what his problem was, 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 was the fact that indeed, uh, you know, you take too much up, upon you uh, to be, to be a, a, as, as a priest. And we see, we can see, for example, in, in Numbers, uh, I wrote down Numbers, the 16th chapter, that's when, they are upset with the things that Moses has, has done. Um, verse 3 says, Take ye too much upon you, seeing all the congregation is holy. You're not the only ones holy, Moses. It said, The congregation is holy, every one of them, and Jehovah is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the assembly of Jehovah? You're better than we are. And so there is indeed that gainsaying of, of Korah and, and trying to uh, put down Moses. Of course, we know he, he indeed was, was destroyed. And uh, it came through rebelling against God and his appointed messengers and appointed ones who had authority. And so they were rejecting uh, God. But there was that uprising, and how did God show whose side he's on? What did the ground do? Open up and swallow them up. Everybody that everybody that connected with Korah, they're going to be put down. Everybody grabbed about it, they're put to death before it's all over. You don't, you don't complain against God and think you're going to get by with it. And so there's the total destruction uh, of these. The, the way could it, things could have gone if Cain, here was the first uh, the children of the first family, and, 
and uh, how that could have worked out. And Abel had such a short life, uh, and Cain was cursed. And uh, both of these men, Balaam and Korah, was, was indeed, they were destroyed. Whoa, whoa, whoa. When ungodly men try to pervert the things of God, and a lot of times it's pride and jealousy, that we want the same power you have, it's, it, it hasn't changed. Human nature hasn't changed it at all with that, all right? What about the love feast? When we speak about, uh, well, let me back, I, I got too far ahead. What about the, the, the love feast here? What, what were they in the first century? A lot of debates about that, but what do you, how do you understand the love feast here? Let's, let's read it uh, in, our, in our text. And Peter kind of describes it a little bit differently. But he said, these are those who are hidden rocks in your love feast when they feast with you. Very sharp statement. We're picking up on that. Uh, when, when Peter uh, speaks about the deceptiveness that are there, he, he, kind, of, he, he kind of puts it in a, in a different way. When uh, they indeed are, are still hidden and they're involved in being deceptive. But there, he speaks about, uh, about their deceptiveness, and, and they're supposed to, to be careful about that. For example, in verse 13, they're suffering wrong doing as a higher wrong doing, the kind of pleasure to reveal, re revel in the daytime. You usually do it at night. Oh, which one? They're not fearful in anything. They revel in the daytime, their spots and blemishes, reveling in their deceivings while they feast with you. While they feast with you. That's Peter's. A point. They're practicing these ungodly things in the daytime. They're not ashamed of that. But they feast with you. And Jude speaks about the, the, the love feast there. Any, any thoughts that you've studied what, what, or what you've been taught in the past? Well, they're, they're without value. They're not what they appear to be. Okay. Now, and the people that comprise them. But let's just talk about love feasts. What, that, what might that be? Some have said it's the Lord's Supper. That they had a meal with the Lord's Supper, and it was a love feast. And they equate that a lot with the Lord's Supper. There's no reason to say that. But that's how people a lot of times get into the, get the, for, uh, the fellowship hall in with the Lord's Supper. You know, we practice the Lord's Supper, but they had love feasts connected to the Lord's Supper. I, I don't see that. If it was a deed, uh, it, we, what we do see is that they may have been perverting something like that because there were people that did not have anything in 1 Corinthians 11. And when they came together to break bread, some were hungry and some were filling their bellies with, with the food. So they may have turned that into what could be considered that, but they even perverted that because did the hungry get fed? They sure did. You love the poor? <laughs> well, they went to your feast and what did they get? Zero. So it, again, that would be a perversion of the Lord's Supper, not a practice that's indeed approved of God. But when you read in Acts, the, Acts, Acts the second chapter, when the disciples, they met together in their homes and they were indeed united together. There's a sense of, of peace there. We are, we are also told in Jesus preparing people for people of the kingdom that invite the people into your home that cannot pay you back, that they, they need food, they're, they're hungry. And we see a lot of this hospitality and taking care of the poor would be done in people's homes. That fits that when you have a feast together to show love to the poor, then there's that sense, that unity that lies there. Praising, verse 46, day by day they continue steadfast with one accord. There's the unity in the temple, and they were breaking bread, not the Lord's Supper, because he calls it food. Lord's Supper is not called food. Breaking bread at home, they took their food with gladness, and what kind of heart? Singleness of heart, united together, whether we're poor, whether we're rich, were sharing together all things. And they, that, that was involved in uh, how they dealt with the, helping the, the saints that were poor. So it very well could be the feast that you sh 
set forth and you invite the people who are poor into your homes. And all of a sudden, you're gathering together. We're all united here, but there's somebody there that's very deceptive. He may be ready to lead a people away uh, into uh, idolatrous practices, uh, committing fornication, because Peter says their, eyes, their, their hearts are exercised in adultery. They can't keep from it. And so they say, see, here's, as a predator, there's a group I can take off in, in a certain way. You had to be, be aware of that. That's what these people are. They're so connected with fornication, and that would be connected with idolatry. But they show up, we're unified brethren. They show up at the love feast. That whole occasion is to help the poor. They look good. But Jude tells us they're not. And these are the people that are going to be destroyed. And he's painting the picture so that people be aware of them. When he says they are hidden rocks, that has a, uh, has a term that dealt with with the sea going vessels. That, that Greek word had a term where, sea, where vessels would come up and, and there would be hidden rocks underneath. And what would happen? They'd hit them and they'd be destroyed. Look out, they are hidden rocks in your love feast. You would not be, not on guard. And that it, it can be destroyed. And so he was to, the people were to take care of it. It wasn't, but the fact that it's a Lord's Supper, and that's what New Testament Christians were doing. So people like to do that day. Any, any questions or comments you'd like to have with that one? Verse 12. What does it say about brethren looking beyond loving words of people? Not that words of people are in that verse. But I have found a lot of people that want to say the right thing. I love my brethren. Do you? And Jerry, you don't love your brethren. Why? Well, you're supposed to speak the truth in love. I believe I do. No, I don't think you do. Because you, I'll tell you what love is. And they begin to say, you're not going to emphasize the doctrine or even talk about doctrine. You really don't love us. And so you can have your own definition of love. I want God's definition of love. And in fact, I want to love the truth enough that I'll cut it straight and not tolerate when, when it's not being cut straight or at least try to set forth the truth and try to help people see it. And people don't want to see it. I understand that. I'm not naive. But I've sensed the fact a lot of people who talk about love, they don't love because I see what they do behind the scenes. I've seen that personally. And what happens is that you begin to be aware that they just say the right words. But in verse, verse 12, here in, in, second, in second Peter, you begin to to see this deceptiveness, to warn people. That's why he's writing this particular uh, epistle. And he, and he wants the people to be aware. That these are they, they're not only hidden rocks, but they're, they're shepherds. They feast with you without fear, feed themselves. They're clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees, and so forth. So they may say the right thing. They're shepherds. They want to say the right words to lead you, but they may, they're going to lead you astray because they're wanting to serve themselves. They're going to be uh, those who, uh, their clouds without water, bring forth the, the cloud, flowery words, but there's no substance to them. It's, it's dead. And a lot of people who wanted to go the social gospel among churches, this is the route we need to go, we show love. Then they, they go away from the teaching of the gospel and saving souls, and they, they, destroy, they destroy the faith. It, we're supposed to love. We're supposed to feed the poor. We can do that in the way that we live as individual Christians without perverting how the church was to operate in our worship and so forth. But I've just, I, maybe you haven't experienced this because people who always want to emphasize love, just be ready to, to see how much do they want to, the love of the truth to be preached. And uh, they want to uh, uh, apply the, the Bible where, where it is on, on various doctrines that they're not going to stand for. But we just love people. And you can love them right in. But where are you going to stand? I want you to contend earnestly for the faith because these are the types of things that happen. And just to get down to the, the words in verse 16, they, they speak great swelling words showing respect to persons for the sake of what? 
for the sake of your encouragement and well-being and, and trying to encourage you with, not lies, but the truth of, of the things they see in you and they commend you for that? No. Whose advantage do they want? No, that's a politician. A politician. That's not a preacher. That's a politician. That's not a, a brother. That's a false brother. I, I've, I've read in my Bible all these years about false brother. I said, what, what is that? You get the truth down and you begin to realize how much we really love you. And then when you are having your trouble, where are they? They talk a good case. They're not there. They never did love you. All they want is what they could get out of you. I've seen that happen as I've grown to maturity as a preacher and a Christian. I've seen young men, oh, they love that preacher, that old preacher over there. They love that preacher. And I saw that. And I remember the preacher coming to me one day, that guy won't even talk to me anymore. Yet they help them in their beginning when they strive. People will use people for their own advantage and then just whew, cut it off. There's your false brethren. What changed? I just don't need you anymore. I don't need you anymore. And that just happens. That's reality. But that's when you begin to realize these truly brethren that when things go bad for, for you, and you were always there for them, they don't have time for you. I remember this, this brother's dead now, but I remember he told me, I, I came to town and wanted to see him, and he says, uh, I'm just too busy, I don't have time to talk to you. And he's the one that gave him his, uh, his start to, about preaching, and praised him all the time. What, how could you look at your mirror like that? But they do, because they, they have, they've made it big, or they think they have. And that just happens in any type of relationship in this world. And that's the case. Are, are just people blowing smoke? Or are they really taking reality? I remember playing golf with a preacher one time, and I would slice it out in the woods. They said, great shot, Jerry. He's trying to encourage me. Well, that wasn't encouragement. Because <laughs> in wasn't reality, that wasn't a good shot. It was a horrible shot. And, but he was just trying to make me feel good. Well, uh, that's not the route to go, but that's the type of personality they are. And they just want to be an encourager. But where's the substance there? And in the faith of, the, of, of Christ that we're speaking about here, they, they only, they show respect to persons, how great and how wonderful you are, but it's only for their own advantage. And when there's no more advantage, look out. You'll find out who they truly are. And I want to be a true brother and sister in Christ. And circumstances don't change it. Circumstances may heighten the need for me to step in and help when maybe I haven't been able to before. But you don't change the love for someone and, and the relationship that you had and just all of a sudden stop it because you, you, you don't get anything out of them anymore. You know, it's, not, it's not helping me, so I'll move on. See how many friends, you, so-called friends, you have like that in life, and it'll be... Interesting, you really appreciate true brethren, sincere brethren. And he's going, is he going to, uh, doing the commentary on Ephesians. Ephesians ends in chapter 6 with the uncorruptible love. People who love God with un incorruptible love. In incorruptible love. Genuine incorruptible love. It doesn't deteriorate. And sometimes love deteriorates with all people. They just talk a good case. But actions are very important. <laughs> All right, any, any comments on that? All right, question number six. What was so sad about these so-called shepherds? They're shepherds, but what's, the, what's, what's their problem? Before God. <laughs> they feed themselves. Remember Paul speaks about, if we could put it in the area of elders of a church, of a local church, shepherds are to tend the what? Tend the flock. We talk about Feeding the flock, nourishing the flock, protecting the flock, tend. It involves all of those things. Because you're seeking the well-being of the, of the sheep, of the flock. Well, these people are, are shepherds in name and without fear. It doesn't bother them. They feed themselves. They feed themselves. Again, there's that selfishness that we're speaking about. That uh, word sometimes come on and you see what truly they're made of. What two points is Jews stressing about false teachers and the illustration of clouds. What does he say about them? 
They're like clouds without what? Without, without water. They're promising you something. I think, oh, I think it's been a while since we had some rain. And they're gone. And they're carried along by the winds. What are two characteristics there you can see of the false teacher? Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. And we're not, we're not to be carried away by the winds of, of doctrine, teaching, just carried away what we want to go. And uh, that's a great description of, of what they we're promising blessings. You follow my way, but in reality, there's no substance there, and they are driven along by the latest thing. And uh, Jude is warning that. And again, the idea of, like you say, being steadfast is very, very important. Uh, was there any hope for good fruit among these teachers or from these teachers? Any hope that Jude has for them? They're twice dead, aren't they? They're twice dead. How could that be? Well, it's going to come to winter time, and, and uh, they're not going to bear fruit. It's winter time. They're dead, but they're not dead. But twice dead is that it's what I've got in my yard, twice dead. <laughs> it's not bearing any fruit, and it's dead in the roots system. And it's just sitting there ready to be taken out when I ever get around to it. So twice dead means there's no more hope for it. And that's exactly, you get to that point. So where there's, where there's life, there's hope. Well, you got a lot of life in them as far as spouting off and teaching this and teaching that. But they're the false teachers. They're carried on by winds, twice dead, plucked up. That's what happens next. Plucked up by the what? By the roots. And uh, God has warned that that's what he does if we're not uh, pruned correctly. So they had gone to the point where they could not be helped. And I think that's a depressing thing. Oh, if I just had a chance to talk to them and, and uh, I get them to see that, I think they've got a good heart and, uh, and all that. Gets to the point where, no, that's not happening. And we have to, we have to admit that as well. Uh, how were the false teachers like waves of the sea? 13, question, verse 13. They're wild waves of the sea. What are they doing? Forming out their own shame. So there's, a, there's the idea of, of well, you've seen the other one, but the idea of the shame is coming up. They're forming it up, and they're wandering stars. Or again, they're blown away like a cloud. They're wandering stars that are, that are taking uh, a place. And, and these, uh, these, these stars uh, are wandering. What, is that, what does the wandering mean here? And... Not that you have to look up every Greek word in the New Testament. Could you guess what the word, what English word we have that's from this Greek word wandering that's translated that? What? The comet? Yeah. You're pretty close. It's where we get our word planet. Planets. And they're banished to where in this verse? Darkness. You know, they're, they're out there and they're turning or whatever they're, what are they doing. And comets are like wandering stars. I think that's good. But the, the Greek, where we get our word planet, comes from these wandering stars. And uh, the idea of, of planets. And they're, they're there and they're, there's no... There's, there's no light within themselves. They're in darkness. What's the, where do we get our light? From the Grand Canyon? Florida? Well, it comes from there from the east. Every morning. We get it from the sun. You know, millions of miles away. As God has planted planets in there. It's just like wandering planets in the dark areas of space. To me, that's a picture and yet they, they, 
they look wonderful. It might be like Jupiter or that Saturn and uh, all the things about it, but there's no substance about it. They're, they're also for whom the blackness of darkness has been reserved forever. And when we think of the, the teachers and the people who, who are trying to take advantage of people and will be at your love feast, but there's really not the love for truth there or for his people who stand for truth. That they're going, they're, they're going to meet their, their end, banished to darkness, where we go, we're going to be put out into everlasting dark, outer darkness, where there'll be the we, what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the picture of uh, eternal destruction, everlasting punishment, hell. And uh, th that's where, that's where the, these, are, these are going. And they were indeed, the, the, those were the false teachers. All right? Question number 11. How were false teachers, well, get it to eleven. Uh, there's the wandering stars point. Jude obtained the prophecy of Enoch from what? Old Testament scriptures are from the book of Enoch. Or did we get this information from inspiration of God? So first of all, do you find what he says here? Enoch being the seventh of Adam, we'll talk about that in a moment. It's saying, this is what Enoch said, Behold, the Lord came with ten thousands of his holy ones, meaning innumerable angels, who, to execute judgment upon all, to convict all the ungodly of all the works of ungodliness which they have ungodly wrought, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Uh, do you ever read in the Old Testament Enoch saying that? No. But there is a apocryphal book called the book of Enoch. And you read verse chapter 21, you'll find something very similar to this. So some have said, why in the book of Enoch in our Bibles? And the point is that if it's an apocryphal book, has God ever inspired men to quote from secular authors in our Bibles? that we find in, in scripture. Titus, Journal of Adam and Crete, and some of their own poets say, Cretans are what? They're slow bellies and, and gluttons. They, 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 they are gluttonous people, they're, they're all liars, and they have slow bellies. They're, they're always, I'm never full, I wanna eat. And where do you find that? He quoted from a poet. That's secular. We don't do it that in our Bibles. Well, it could be, it could be that, and it could be very similar of, a, of the book that was in place at, at that time, the book of Enoch. There was, a, there was more than one Enoch in the Old Testament. And our next qu question, because I think, I think it could be by inspiration of God, but if it's the book of Enoch, does it mean, well, we're, we're beginning secular authors, and therefore it's not inspired of God? Not necessarily. Titus is a good example of that. How far removed from Adam was the time of Enoch that he talks about who wrote these things, about the, the God bringing his angelic host in judgment, which God has promised to do in the uh, New Testament. He's going to be gathered with his angels. Huh? Is that true with our, is that true with our Bible? Is there an Enoch, the seventh from Adam in our Bibles? Hmm? Yeah, it, it, that was a, a, you had Seth and he had Enoch. That ain't the one we're talking about, is it? This was the, that's why we have it. It's the seventh from Adam. Now you gotta count Adam, but you go to Genesis the fifth chapter and you count Adam, number one, then you start naming, you get it too. By the time you get to number seven, it's Enoch, it's Enoch. So the seventh from Adam prophesied of this judgment coming, and I think just because we don't find it in the Old Testament doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And God, by inspiration, lets us know some things that are not talked about in the Old Testament. Does that make them uh, not inspired when we see them in the New Testament? Or we have to say, well, God, whenever this came directly from, it, it's very similar to the book of Enoch, not word by word translation. 
But even if he used Enoch, which was a secular work, not a biblical inspired uh, text, he could be doing that. He talked about the poets and, he, and Paul preached about that in Acts 17 in another case. And he, talked, he brought out the truth that is of, of their own poets and their own writers. Well, this is the, I, Enoch could have prophesied about those things. No Testament didn't bring it out. But he surely was the seventh from Adam. Adam is that first, and you start counting things from where it begins, and you go to seven, you'll find that. So I think it's by inspiration of God that indeed it came forth. Not that, uh, you know, the book of Enoch was, was found, and it kind of later on in the uh, time of history that uh, uh, may not have been time of the first century. But indeed, there was some writings of Enoch, that seventh from Adam, that very well could be there, and we have it here. There's no untruth about it, what Jesus has promised and what the inspired scriptures promised. So I think it came by inspiration of God. How did the prophecy of Enoch relate to the false teachers of Jude's day? He emphasized these are ungodly men doing ungodly things and <laughs> ungodly sinners, ungodly. Did they reverence God? No, they're, they're wanting to serve themselves. And that's what he's, he speaks. Indeed, the judgment is going to be uh, indeed a, a part of that. They were ungodly works and they were spoken against God. Because you're not speaking the truth of God and your works show that. Okay. We, won't, we got question 14. We'll, we'll hit that. It'll be a good way to sum up this section of Jude as we go to the encouraging points of, of the latter part of this uh, epistle. And we'll, next time, Lord willing, we'll be able to finish that. And be, be looking at Acts. We'll be, we'll, hitting that. we'll be hitting that, Lord willing, when we get through. Any, any comments you want to uh, add before we call it a night? Okay. Thank you.